Welcome to this presentation of Santa Barbara's Earthquakes, Droughts, Floods, and Shipwrecks through Vintage Postcards and Photographs. Part 5 will describe the dramatic rescue and aftermath of the Honda disaster. My name is George Sampanis and I will be your host as we open a window into Santa Barbara's past. September 8th, 1923. In part four, we touched upon the sinking of the SS Cuba and the rescue of her passengers and crew by the U.S. destroyer Reno, as well as the causes and events leading to the United States Navy's greatest peacetime disaster in which 22 sailors and seven destroyers were lost in the graveyard of the Pacific. Today, we will look at some of the heroic rescue efforts by the brave sailors and the Santa Barbara citizens whose effort saved untold hundreds of lives. In an isolated, remote, and desolate area, the Southern Pacific Railroad, as a means of inspecting and protecting their tracks, erected a station house, two rows of bunkhouses providing quarters for 16 men, and a barn, the only structures for miles. Living in the house was Southern Pacific Railroad section foreman John Giorvis, a square-set, middle-aged man of Greek ancestry. On the evening of the disaster, he heard two sounds like muffled explosions. He ran to the second story of his home and, looking out over the window, saw a light appear and then disappear. It was shortly after 9 p.m. Giorvis grabbed the lantern and rushed out, crossing the tracks, and made his way down the dangerous sloping mesa, pitted with holes, tangled roots and branches. When he reached the cliff, he laid down on his stomach, head and shoulders over the ledge. He thought he heard voices and shouted several times, but heard no response. He immediately returned to the station house and called his supervisor, train master T.J. Foley reporting what appeared to be a shipwrecked U.S. Naval destroyer. Foley made arrangement for sending doctors, surgical supplies, food, blankets, and clothing to the site of the wreck. He ordered a steam shovel car gang and fence crew to Honda to provide assistance wherever needed. Loading stretches onto a baggage car, he headed south to the disaster. Giorvis returned to the wreck and quickly set upon helping rescue men from the Delphi. He was able to get a rope to the crew, who connected it to heavy line, which was pulled ashore, setting up a means for the sailors to work their way there. The rescuers and uninjured sailors spent hours dragging men out of the water. Moments earlier, the Delphi's stern was close enough for some sailors to jump from the fantail and propeller guard onto the rocks. Oil from a punctured tank surged into the sea, mixed with the surf, and washed over the ship. Then the pounding surf swung the stern around away from the rocks, closing that avenue of escape. Three men who had jumped into the sea from the bow were overwhelmed by the pounding waves. Delphi engineer first class Raymond Rodenhamel ventured down the oil drenched ladder attached to the ship and was able to snatch them one by one back onto the ship. The last, James Pearson, fireman first class, seconds before he had dived into the sea to save sailors in trouble. Tragically, the glasses he was wearing smashed and pieces of glass lodged into his eyes, blinding him and causing great pain. Twice, he went under before Rhoda Hamill, with help, was able to finally get a now unconscious Pearson onto the ship. When Pearson regained consciousness, crazed by pain in his eyes and by the effects of the fuel he had swallowed, he fought with the strength of a maniac, as if demon-possessed. For his own safety and that of the rest of the crew, 
he was tied to an angle iron while ways to abandon ship were weighed. Lieutenant Blodgett thought the closest rock about 20 feet away could be reached by a strong swimmer. E.R. Weisendager immediately volunteered and dived into the oily sea. Twice, he was washed out of sight beneath the Delphi's bottom by a vicious undertow while miraculously avoiding being crushed between the rocks and the ship. Somehow, he made it and climbed the oily rocks. A line was thrown and then a second establishing a means of escape. With one end secured to the rocks and the other end secured to the deck house, he was taxed with keeping the line taut and with the swaying of the ship letting out enough line. Volunteers took on this Herculean task. Then a monstrous breaker lifted the Delphi as James Conway, fireman third class, was on the line. The line slackened and then went taut as a piano wire and slingshot the poor sailor to his death. Another casualty, cabin cook Sorfonia Dalida, who was after falling from the line, choked and drowned from oil in his lungs. It was determined that it was impossible to get Pearson across until daylight in calm seas on a raft or on a breeches buoy. Pharmacist mate George Jordan was busy attending to the needs of those in shock, concussions, broken bones, bruises, and by far most prevalent with deep cuts to hands and feet from the razor sharp lava. No one knew where they were, but the sound of a locomotive whistle raised all their spirits. They were not castaways on some deserted island, but on the mainland. A few men were able to scale the cliffs and make it to the rails when they saw a fire and joined the sailors from the SS Lee. Before continuing, I want to state the heroic events described on and around the grounded ships are but a few of the many, many daring, brave, and gallant efforts performed that day. The men with the steam shuttle, the fence gangs, Geovis's crew, and local citizens work with great energy to get the men ashore from the wrecked ships. First aid was provided and bonfires were built in the bluffs and near the station house to provide light for the rescue effort and warmth for the sailors who made it ashore. Fortunately, there was a hefty stack of railroad ties nearby to fuel the fires. Meanwhile, W.S. Brandt, Lompoc City Marshal, had been notified and together with Ronald Adams, owner and editor of the Lompoc Record, made haste. After a hectic ride on a dark, narrow, curvy, badly paved country road, they jumped on a waiting motor track car. It was dark and foggy as they made their way towards the scene. Suddenly, one of the railroad men on the track car yelled, Quick, everybody, get off the car, get it off the track, there's a train coming. Together, they lifted the car off the track before a huge blur of light exploded out of the fog as the locomotive flashed by. Though the oncoming train could not be seen, the railroader's keen sense had felt the vibration of the train through the soles of his feet, avoiding what would have been yet another tragedy at Honda. The S.P. Lee was in a perilous position, listing 30 degrees when Captain Toaz saw through the fog a ship bearing down on the Lee. Suddenly, as an answer to his prayers, she had come to an abrupt halt stopped by a cluster of rocks. Asking for volunteers to take a rock across the churning waters to scale the 100-foot cliff, many responded, but two were picked. Coxswain C.M. Carlson and Seaman First Class C.J. Stahl. The men in a small rubber raft fought their way towards the cliff about 50 feet away. They were tossed, spun, tilted, and they paddled desperately. 
they made it to the base of the cliff only because that is where the raging sea took them. Clinging spread eagle to the wet, slippery surface like human flies, they eventually were able to establish a hold with two lines and make it back to the ship. The ferrying of the men commenced, eight per raft trip. As the captain and the commander, being the last to leave, entered the raft, they heard the loud whistle of a train as cheers and jubilation revived the spirits of the shivering oil-drenched men cramped, standing shoulder to shoulder on the small ledge. Stahl and Carlson returned to the group, having found a somewhat negotiable passage. It was a slow, steep, dangerous climb. Wherever one stepped or touched, they were cut by lava as sharp as broken bottles. Pharmacist mate M.C. Watts, shoeless and dressed only in his skivvies, bleeding himself upon reaching the mesa, administered aid to the scores of injured by wiping cuts and fashioning bandages torn from garments to stop bleeding. At that moment, Giorvis and his crew emerged out of the fog. Watts told Giorvis that at least three destroyers were on the rocks. We'll need doctors and medical supplies, he urged. Giorvis told him how to reach the section house and ran back to telephone the needs and the grim news. Commander Toaz and a small group of men headed south in search of the Delphi. The young's hull was ripped open along the length of the starboard side, flooding the watertight compartments. The sharp lava rocks sliced her open with the ease of an electric can opener. In just 90 seconds, she was flat on her side. As she rolled, most of the crew following orders to stay with the ship and their instinct followed her over grasping for a foothold. Those who did not met their death by drowning, as did the poor souls below deck, an engine man and seven firemen. Fearing an explosion from the steam built up in the boilers, Captain Calhoun asked for a volunteer to turn off the master valves below deck. Fireman First Class F.T. Scott agreed. The boilers did not explode, nor did Scott return. With surf crashing over the ship and men clinging to the porthole handholds created by Peterson's axe, he set upon recovering hemp rope and with lines tied the men together in groups of eight for safety. They looked like stacks of asparagus. Then all went dark for the 80 men, 18 inches above the surface of the sea. The nearest piece of land, Bridge Rock, was 100 yards away. Peterson and Executive Lieutenant Gene Hersinger were about to try the impossible, swim through the surging waters just as the Chauncey came crashing by and hurled high on the ledge, where she lay, cut the swimming distance by about 25 yards and had an effect of calming the surging sea. Captain of the Chauncey Richard Booth's first obligation was to get his men ashore and second to help rescue the men on the young. With great difficulty, two lines were carried to shore and immediately two of her rafts began ferrying men to the western cliffs of the Bridge Rock, while unbeknownst to the Chauncey, the Delphi was on the northern shore of the same rock. The rafts were soon covered with oil and very slippery, and as they tried to step ashore, the oil was also on the rocks, causing men to skid and fall. In the dark, they made their way up the almost perpendicular cliff sustaining cuts to hands and feet. Reaching the top, they saw half-clad men from the Delphi staggering, freezing, and dazed. Back on the young, Peterson fashioned and knotted together three 40-foot ropes, 
tied one end to a stanchion and the other to a donut life preserver. With a grin on his face, he asked Captain Calhoun, Permission to go ashore, sir? Permission granted, Pete, and God go with you. Fighting the surging, oil-covered breakers, he was able to overcome and swim the 75 yards to the Chauncey, where he exchanged the line for a stronger one. Obtaining a seven-man raft from the Chauncey, he returned safely to the young with the raft. After 12 arduous trips between the ships, all those accounted for were safely on the Chauncey by 11.30 p.m., some two and a half hours after the crash. Unfortunately, missing were those who had been swept to sea and the poor souls penned in the lower compartments with no chance to escape. From the Chauncey, the crew of the young then faced the hazard of being ferried from the Chauncey to Bridge Rock and then up the steep lacerating wall of the rugged rock. Captain Davis had tried unsuccessfully to back the Woodbury off the rock and in so doing, the gap between the bow and the rock widened. Lines were finally secured and the evacuation began. Chief Radio Man Grover Dickman described it this way. The destroyer was settling in the stern. As the thundering breakers struck her, the bow would rise and fall. The lines would become taut and strained until the walls of the roaring water rolled past. Then they would become slack and sag. As officers and men climbed, monkey fashion, over the line from the ship to shore, only superhuman effort kept them hanging on from the snapping houses. In the process of abandoning the ship, two of the crew thought they heard a call for help near the bow. Shining a light, they saw a man struggling to swim. H.F. Williams, seaman second class, jumped into the sea and with the aid of the second, N.H. Owens, quartermaster first class, pulled him aboard. The second swimmer was found to be Boatswain's mate, Braden, who had been washed overboard from the side of the young. Eventually, all made it to the rock where the ship's heavy wooden plank was chopped up for fuel to light tar pots and paint cans. The fog was so thick it had become a moisture-soaked blanket. Shortly after midnight, the captains of the four ships, Delphi, Lee, Young, and Chauncey, whose crews were on the mainland, made a tally of their men, 28 missing, 25 from the Young, three from the Delphi. Both the Lee and the Chauncey had accounted for all their crew. In the meantime, Donald Sutton a local rancher had been awakened by his wife after the constant ringing of their party line telephone. After listening in and learning of a shipwreck and being aware the Arguello light had no telephone, she asked her husband to drive there and inform them of the activity. After driving the rough and bumpy grade, he arrived there to find five bruised and bewildered sailors recently pulled from the sea. The men were in no condition to survive the tortuous ride to the section house, so he drove there to get medical help for the sailors. Upon arrival with the news of the five, Captain Calhoun of the Young was told they were from his ship, and one of the five was named Scotty. Thank God for that, thank God for that, said the captain. The lighthouse crew had been aroused about 10.30 p.m. by cries for help from the sea. No landings could be made at the rocky point where they were because of the sheer cliffs and pounding surf. They were redirected to the southern, more protective cliffs where lines were dropped from the almost perpendicular 75-foot cliffs. So exhausted, numb with cold, 
and drenched with oil, the men could not muster the strength to tie the ropes around themselves. Two men were sent down the ropes, tied ropes around each of the survivors, and then they were lifted out one by one up upon the cliff. Scott, believed to be lost after going below to close the master valve on the Young's burners, told the following, through God-given strength, I was able to open the airlock scuttle and then was sucked into the sea as I reached the submerged deck. I grabbed some sort of flotsam and passed out. Upon awakening, he was in smooth waters and deep silence when he bumped into a raft and was pulled aboard. With no visibility, all began to shout and then would listen. Soon they heard a response and paddled in that direction, coming upon three men in a raft without a paddle. Taking hold of the grab ropes, they were pushed by seas and driven by a northwest wind. At about two o'clock in the morning, a relief train arrived carrying heaps of blankets, comforters, overalls, trousers, coats, and sweaters donated by the residents of Lompoc. While nowhere near enough to go around, but the neediest were taken care of. Also, getting off the train and making her way through the crowds of sailors was Mrs. Charles Atkins, wife of the telegraph officer at Surf. In a large market basket, she carried several dozen eggs, quarts of milk, pounds of coffee, and loaves of bread, hardly enough to feed 400 sailors. But her mere presence elevated the spirits of the sailors and of the two exhausted Lompoc doctors who had arrived earlier caring for the injured. Railroad foreman Tobin gave news that food would be arriving with the train at 4 a.m., that same train would take the most seriously injured to the cottage hospital in Santa Barbara. Upon its arrival, the railroad gang loaded the injured onto the train and unloaded boxes of food and medical supplies provided by the citizens, restaurants, and markets in San Luis Obispo. With the seriously injured taken care of, Mrs. Atkins turned her attention to making coffee and sandwiches. Pictured here, Ma Atkins, as the sailors called her, serving shivering sailors coffee. Her help in dressing wounds and her gentle willingness to do anything that would make the boys comfortable would be remembered for many years by the Navy men. Mrs. Atkins mothered the boys for nearly 24 hours without rest. With gaping holes on the fuller's side, being pounded badly and in danger of slipping off her perch and sinking, Captain Seed's thoughts were on evacuating the ship. He called for volunteers to launch the whaleboat and make its way to the Woodbury with lines to allow ferrying between the ships. Assessing the situation, Ensign Jones determined the whaleboat had to be launched starboard, navigate around the fuller's stern to the port side, grab the hawser, row to the Woodbury, and make fasten the hawser. From the start, things did not go well. As the whale boat was being lowered, suspended a few feet above the water, a huge wave dropped the end of the boat into the sea. Quick thinking, the men on the deck immediately cast loose the forward fall. While avoiding being swamped, the only light was smashed and the oar lock was damaged beyond repair. Without the help of the steering oar, they zigzagged their way towards a passage between two big rocks, as shown here. At that moment, a huge wave lifted the whale boat up and over the rocks, but without the steering oar and the raging seas, the whale boat could not get close to the ship. Instead, Jones 
boarded the boat out to sea and drifted with the current, hoping to try again during daylight. With the whaleboat vanished, an attempt was made in heavy seas to send a rubber craft with four men the 100 yards to the Woodbury. The raft was reduced to a plaything by the seas, spinning, yawing, and flipping it over, dumping the men into the sea. Somehow, through divine grace, they all made it back to the raft and were pulled back aboard the fuller. With the sea pounding her, Captain C feared she might turn over. As dawn broke, the whale boat appeared as if a great ghost in the gray dawn. Captain Seed, shouting over wind and wave, asked Jones if he could try to take a line to the Woodbury. After several attempts failed, they were able to make it to the rock, hand over hand. They were ordered to stay where they were, on the rock. Conditions worsened as higher and higher waves cascaded over her forecastle when Frank Moon, of previous heroics, approached the captain volunteering to swim across the, with the line. Contemplating for a brief moment, the captain offered, I'll see if I can swim across. If I can, follow me with the line. Leaving Executive Officer Homer Davis in charge, he went on to say, if I make it, send Moon over with the line and have the crew in life jackets haul themselves over the line one at a time. If I don't make it, good luck, you're on your own. Tossing off his jacket, hat, and shoes, he made a running start and dived into the water so rough it boiled and bubbled like a witch's cauldron. Both he and Moon made it to the outstretched hands of Jones and his men on the rock. Once the lines were fastened, the abandoning of ship proceeded. Though there was much difficulty, with crisis upon crisis, all made it to the rock safely. The Nichols skipper, Lieutenant Commander Herbert Roche, did his utmost to prevent the loss of the destroyer as the heavy seas broke over her and the Honda rocks pushed into her hull. But the ship was taken by currents and drifted slowly astern coming to a stop, stern high, on a clump of rocks with a 25% list to starboard. Throughout the night, the four stackers' crew strove valiantly in the face of Honda's heavy odds, but in the morning, as the waves mounted and the Nicholas's situation became critical, the captain ordered, abandon ship. Having secured a lifeline between the Nicholas and the shore, the rescue was extremely dangerous. In a raft, six or seven men at a time were subjected to oil-covered waves dowsing the men. Many were thrown overboard, but were able to make it to shore. On the shore, railroad gangs and local farmers had brought ropes and tackle and were on the small strip of beach to haul in the rafts after each was loaded. By the time the last load had been taken off the Nicholas, she had sunk considerably and was in the danger of rolling onto her side. The last load included Captain Roche and other officers. A huge swell tossed the raft, flipping all into the sea. Some were able to get back on the raft, but others were carried away from it. Then another swell threw them towards the shore and another back towards the raft, close enough that those in the boat could pull them in. Yet another miracle. The evacuation of the Nicholas was accomplished without loss of life. Fog from the shore had shrouded the Woodbury and the Fuller, as well as a commercial fishing boat, the Buena Amor de Roma, as she came puttering out of the fog. Her captain, Giovanni Nocetti, commanded one of the boats of the Larco fishing fleet. You may recall Sebastian Larco being mentioned in previous presentations. The Roma would play a heroic part in rescuing the castaways 
on Woodbury or Destroyer Rock, a task that took plenty of courage, daring seamanship, and long, tiring hours. The Santa Barbara Daily News on September 10th reported, the Roma left Santa Barbara with her sister fishing boat, the North America, at 1 a.m. Sunday morning to fish off of the Honda Banks. Neither knew of the disaster. Suddenly, at daybreak Sunday, the Roma found herself trolling past a wreck. The dim outline of a destroyer, the fuller, could be seen through the veil of fog. Putting in closer, Captain Nocetti discovered men clinging to bare rocks. Forgetting their trolling lines, the fishermen threw over their anchor and rushed for their skiff. They worked almost till noon carrying men from the Fuller and the Woodbury to the Summers and the Percival. Their first rescue was of five men who had clung all night long to a projecting reef unable to reach the main rock because of terrific seas that were running. These five men had hung and clung on through the long night hours with the grimness of determination. But when they felt the strong arms of the fishermen encircling them, they fell back limp and were lifted aboard by two fishermen while a third held fast to the rock to keep the frail skiff from being dashed to pieces against the reef. Those four fishermen worked without ceasing until they, with whale boats finally sent to their aid by the destroyers standing out to sea, had completed taking the men aboard. The task finished, Captain Nocetti ordered his men on with their trolling in a matter of fact way, as though saving men from wrecked vessels and reefs was all in a day's work. Final tally of personnel was taken at noon on the 9th. The Delphi's loss of three did not change, but the count of the capsized young was reduced to 20. While any loss of life is devastating, but through the heroic efforts of the sailors previously mentioned and the many not mentioned herein, the count was nothing short of miraculous. Some 800 men who were aboard the seven ill-fated destroyers had been at risk. And on shore, enough cannot be said about the civilian heroes without whose help hundreds of lives could have been lost. Thanks to the Southern Pacific Railroad for all their contributions, including providing 40 railroad men, as well as facilities and equipment. Pictured in these photographs are railroad section foreman Giorvis, whose keen ears and eyes, presence of mind, and physical stamina and determination played such a vital role in the rescue effort. And train master Foley, whose arrangements for the relief train and other services was timely and graciously provided. Special recognition is given to Lompoc doctors Kelleher and Hyges, who treated cuts and gashes, broken bones, hypothermia, and other ailments. Ma Atkins, for her unceasing efforts to provide first aid, coffee, food, and comfort to hundreds. Local ranchers and farmers, who rigged up breaches buoys from the clifftop down to the wrecked ships. The generosity of Lompoc, San Luis Obispo, and surf citizens who contributed food, blankets, and muscle power. To Captain Nocetti and crew of the Roma for their perilous, daring, and courageous rescue efforts. And to scores not specifically mentioned. A special train was assembled in San Francisco and reached Honda at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, where 38 officers and 517 enlisted men boarded the train. After a long stop in Santa Barbara, where the Red Cross and YMCA served sandwiches, coffee, and cakes, the train continued on to San Diego. 
Having been stripped of her valuable material, the destroyers were written off as total losses. Due to the difficult location of the wrecks and the effects of the pounding Pacific surf on the ship hulls, no scrapping was ever performed and the ships were left to their fate. Wave action began breaking up the stranded ships. Day after day, week after week, pounding wave action and grinding against the rocks turned the destroyers into smashed and twisted skeletons. The waves picked the wrecks bare as bones, the rocks chewing them into rusty remnants. As they slipped into deeper and deeper water, the devil's jaw was finished his chewing waiting for the next victim. A detail of 17 men and two officers with weak bodies and shattered nerves was left at the scene to watch for bodies and prevent looting of the ships. Somehow, through all the confusion, the Navy dropped the ball. They were left there three days camping like refugees or castaways without shelter and adequate supplies. They had to sleep in the open since the Giorvis section house had been converted into a morgue. As word of their plight reached the citizens of Lompoc, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo, they provided food, blankets, and other essentials. After a few days, as seas subsided, they were able to board the Chauncey and obtain ample provisions and supplies. Over the next eight weeks, a total of 17 bodies were recovered. Six were never found. On September 11, 1923, three days after the disaster, the Navy wasted no time in establishing a court of inquiry. The board's responsibility was to thoroughly sift through and determine the facts and to give its opinion as to whether any offenses occurred. The inquiry was to be held in secret as was normally the case in such matters. The throngs of newspaper reporters conjured up their own theories. Was there something to hide? Bring out all the facts into the open, they demanded. The next day, someone fumbled the ball by sending a report of the inspection of the Summers and Farragut to the wrong Navy Department. A matter of small import, but things got blown out of proportion. First reports said five ships, then seven, now two more. With outrage, wild guesses, and vicious gossip coming from all corners, the Secretary of the Navy, Edwin Denby, ordered the inquiry be held publicly, entirely contrary to custom. Now, what was a tragic accident became a witch hunt, looking for heads to roll. For 19 days, the Board of Inquiry interviewed the captains and some of the crew. Two weeks into the proceedings, Captain Watson, in his closing remarks, under oath, lamenting the loss of his shipmates, took full responsibility, fully and solely responsible. None of his subordinates should be blamed. Captain Calhoun, while testifying, broke down as he read the names of the 20 men who perished when the young rolled over. He commended Captain Watson. I can only hope that if I ever am faced with the tragedy that faced him that night, I'll be half the man that he was. Cool, courageous, and thoughtful, never missing an opportunity to aid. On October 31st, the court's unexpected findings were announced. The court of inquiry ruled that the disaster was the fault of the fleet commander and the flagship's navigators. They assigned blame to the captain of each ship following the tradition that a captain's first responsibility is to his own ship, even when in formation. Eleven officers involved would be brought before the general court-martial on the charges of negligence and culpable inefficiency to perform one's duty. What had happened to the fall of the leader long established but unwritten destroyer doctrine? The findings were greeted with satisfaction by the press and the public 
and especially so by congressional politicians who had been criticized for not having passed appropriations the previous year for equipment which might have averted the disaster. With Secretary Derby's uttered approval, it seemed as if certain factions in Washington, the real tragedy at Honda was the loss of seven splendid fighting ships. The 23 unreplaceable lives seemed to be of secondary importance. 23 officers and men were recommended for citations by the Board of Inquiry and over 75 more by Rear Admiral Kittle, commander of destroyer squadrons. I will highlight several. For coolness, intelligence, and seamanlike ability, William Calhoun, commander of the young. For great bravery in swimming a distance of about 75 yards through a rough and turbulent sea in order to test the feasibility of and make arrangements for the salvage of his crew, Walter Seed, Lieutenant Commander of the Fuller. For displaying courage in volunteering and manning a whale boat, which they pulled throughout the night in the face of constant and imminent danger, Ensign Jones and his whale boat crew. For extraordinary heroineship in swimming with the line from the young to the Chauncey in heavy and turbulent seas, Arthur Peterson, chief boatswain's mate. For extraordinary heroism in swimming with the line from the fuller to a rock through a rough and turbulent sea in order to salvage the crew of that vessel, Frank Moon, machinist mate first class. For remaining at his post in the engine room of the Chauncey until the water was above his waist, C.G. Ostergaard, machinist first class. And for meritorious conduct in remaining at their post in the fire room of the fuller until driven out by the inrush of rising water, five seamen. The general court-martial convened on 1 November. Squadron Commander Captain Edward H. Watson and the Delphi's Lieutenant Commander Donald Hunter were found guilty of culpable inefficiency and negligence. With the exception of the Nichols skipper, Commander Roche, all the other skippers were found not guilty, and Roche's guilty verdict was soon overturned by Admiral Robison. While both were denied future promotions, Donald Hunter went on to serve as navigator on the battleship Nevada and later as an instructor at the Naval War College. Captain Watson was commended by his peers and the government for assuming full responsibility of the disaster at Honda Point. He could have tried to blame a variety of factors for the disaster, but instead he set a great example for those others by allowing the responsibility to be placed entirely on his shoulders. His energetic leadership of rescue operations and display of personal character became widely known and admired in and outside the Navy. He served out his career as Assistant Commandant of the 14th Naval District at Pearl Harbor and retired in 1929. In 1974, a team of divers recovered the anchor from the Chauncey and placed it on a cement pad near the site as a memorial. In this picture, a ceremony was held near the anchor to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the wrecks, and a plaque listing the names of the 23 lost sailors was dedicated. Since then, the bluff on which the anchor rested has been deemed unstable, and due to numerous safety hazards, the anchor and plaque have been removed and are on display for all to see at the Lompoc Historical Society.